Hey, OnScript listeners, this is Matt Lynch coming to you from Regent College in Vancouver. I'm a co-host along with Matt Bates, Drew Johnson, Aaron Heim, Chris Tilling, Amy Brown, Hughes, and Jules martinez Olivieri. We have a republished episode here with Dr. Beverly Gaventa, who's a real rock star in the world of New Testament studies. And so I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. We broadcasted this episode a long time ago, so felt like it was time to bring this one out again. Uh, if you could give us a rating on Apple Podcasts, we'd appreciate that, or wherever you listen. Um, if you're not driving at the moment or uh, skateboarding or something, um, if you could just look at the platform where you listen to this, and um, you know maybe it has a button that says Rate Episode, and you could give it a five-star rating, because this one's a five-star episode. And then, um, for instance, if, if there's an episode with with Drew Johnson, you could give it a, uh, a one star, two star rating. Two star would be great for Drew. I mean, that's a that's a good score for for an episode with Drew. Um, so we'd appreciate that. Uh, so any anything you can do to help get the word out about what we're doing here, we would be grateful for it. Aaron Himes can be hosting this one. So enjoy. Welcome on Script Listeners. This is Aaron Heim coming to you from Denver, Colorado, and you are in for a real treat with this episode because today I'm joined by Beverly Roberts Gaventa, who is a giant in our field. In fact, Beverly, I actually joke with my students that I want to be Beverly Gaventa when I grow up. Um, but the reason I say that is because your work on Paul made me love Paul when I was first starting out and because you made me a better reader of scripture. So Beverly Gaventa, Beverly Roberts Gaventa, is the Distinguished Professor of New Testament at Baylor University. She has previously taught courses uh, or taught at Princeton Seminary, Columbia Seminary, and Colgate Rochester Divinity School. She is a prolific author, and she's written in a number of areas of New Testament, but perhaps most significant are her numerous articles and books on Pauline literature and on Acts. Beverly, it's an honor to have you here today. Welcome to OnScript. Oh, thank you, Erin. I look forward to talking with you. Now, I just said that I wanted to be Beverly Gaventa when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> but when you Why don't you just be Erin? <laughs> I, 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 I will. I will. I, I just, I'm kidding. But um, when you were a kid, um, did you think I want to grow up and be a biblical scholar? Oh, goodness, no. <laughs> um, I grew up in a fairly conservative branch of Christianity. I remember asking a Sunday school teacher when I was about 10, if uh, women could, if girls could be pastors. And she said, no, honey, they can't. And that was the end of that. Uh, but I did think maybe I wanted to be a Christian educator or something along those lines. I wasn't quite giving up. Uh, so... Yeah, but I, I had a lot of ideas. At one point, I thought I would be a concert pianist. Uh, at one point, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. Um, all sorts of things at, you know, at a, at a tender age. Hmm. So how did you get interested in the academic study of the Bible? Well, I went to, I was the first person in my family to go to college. That's part of the formation. Uh, for me, that was a real gift. Um, I became, I was a religion major from the beginning, and I was very interested in the Reformation. I was interested in theology and literature. I hated Bible. My Bible courses as an undergraduate were boring. Uh, that's all I can say about them. Blessedly, I did take Greek. So when I got to Union Seminary in New York with this plan of doing Reformation studies, or theology and literature. I had two ideas about this. I um, enrolled in courses on the New Testament because they made me. Um, and the first thing I did was a course on the Gospel of Mark. I fell in love with doing exegesis, I think is the thing. And then the, the real pivot was the next semester, I took a course on Romans with J. Lewis Martin. And that was it. You know, I, it was that was the that was the story. Uh, that's where it all started. Um, I never got back to Luther. I thought I might as well study Romans because it was important for Luther, and I I never got back to to Luther. And did you always know you wanted to be a professor? 
No, uh, that's a piece I left out. When I was an undergraduate, I mentioned that I was the first person in my family to go to college. I fell in love with college. And about five or six weeks in, I thought to myself, this is great. What do I have to do to stay here? And that's, that, was, that was the beginning of that idea, uh, that I really wanted to be a researcher, a teacher, a writer. Yeah. Hmm. And your your body of work is is fairly eclectic. Did you um, did you set out to be that eclectic in your scholarship? No, I I didn't have a research plan as such. I never have had a research plan as such. I um, I was very interested in Paul. My dissertation was on Paul's conversion, and when I set out to turn it into a book, I had to do this work on Acts because. You can't talk about Paul's conversion to, for too long without talking about Acts. And I kind of took a little detour that I thought would take a couple of months, and it took several years instead, and I ended up writing a little commentary, as you know. Um, and then I was asked to do the book on Mary that also was a, a different side venture, uh, but eventually got back to Paul, which has been my first love and my my remaining love, so my abiding passion. <laughs> Mine too, and I think that's what yeah has drawn me to your work over and over and over again. It's just you can tell when I when I read your work on Paul that you love Paul. It's not just a you know, it's a it's a it is passionate scholarship. Well, I just always learn new things, and I, I mean, just this morning I thought, oh, I've never thought about that before. So maybe it just means I'm a slow learner. And I don't remember what I've already learned before, but I'm always seeing things I haven't noticed before. So throughout this eclectic body of work, you do have a focus on an unrelenting interest in the unrelenting God, or at least that's according to the authors of your or editors of your Festschrift. So. Uh, at a time when some within biblical studies are seeking to limit the amount of theology that we allow into our analysis, you know, your work has been consistently theological, consistently interested in what the New Testament authors have to say about God. So why have you resisted that pull toward history that some in, in biblical studies have? Well, I think any, uh, any concern can become reductionistic. You know, and I, 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 I think the concern about history, the concern about social world, uh, those are valid, important concerns. But I don't think we can do justice to those texts without doing justice to the thing that seems to drive them in the first place, which is their preoccupation with what God's doing in the world. Um, I think it's possible to notice that and to be. Uh, interested in it, whether you yourself have a, a um, have a conviction about that God or not, it's entirely possible to pay attention to the figure of God in these texts without being committed personally that to that God. I think there's sort of a mistake that goes on in the assumption that if you talk about theological issues, you've thereby uh, given up any his interest in history or uh, you're, you're doing an injustice. I just want to take seriously the subject matter of the text in the same way I would do if I were reading Shakespeare or Milton or Dickens or anybody else. Hmm. Okay, speaking of theology, one of my on-script co-hosts, Matt Bates, to call him out by name, admitted in our last episode, uh, our last Q&A episode, that he holds an unpopular opinion. And he says, I'm not a fan of Karl Barth. And he uh -huh. says that Bart is a huge snooze fest and that he gets nothing <laughs> out of him. Now, Matt also admits that he should be embarrassed about that. Um, and I agree with him. He should be embarrassed about that. But I know that you love Carl Bart. And I know, um, and I love Carl Bart. And you actually wrote in your essay for I Still Believe that the prefaces in Bart's Romans commentary captured your imagination. So, Beverly, what would you say to Matt to convince him that he's just dead wrong about Karl Barth? Well, I am not an expert on Karl Barth by any means, um, and I would not want to pass myself off at that as that. But I think Barth's exegesis is 
always informative. Sometimes I think he's wrong, uh, but particularly in the Romans commentary, uh, there is a passion there about not domesticating the text. And I think that's the most important, not reducing it to the voice we want to hear. I've actually been rereading the commentary in the recent months because of a conference that's coming up. And I find it fresh on every page. So I would say to Matt, maybe he needs to try again. <laughs> See, Matt, you need to try again. If you're, if you're listening, you need to try again. Romans commentary, Karl Barth. Oh, and we've, we've continued to talk about the relationship in Oddscript between biblical studies and theology. And rumor has it, because none of us, I think, have actually taken this course. But when you taught at Princeton Seminary, you used to co-teach a seminar with Bruce McCormick called Paul and Carl. That's true. I did. What's yeah. It, oh, what's it like to, to co-teach with a theologian as a biblical scholar? Well, it, it's, I, I think it's wonderful to co-teach with anybody. I co-taught a course on vocation with Nancy Duff. I co-taught one on sin and salvation with Jack Lapsley, an Old Testament scholar. Uh, and I'm probably forgetting some others that I've done. Uh, recently with David Whitford, a church historian here on the history of the interpretation of Paul. And of course, one of the things that's great, if you're a long-term learner, as we are, is just to sit and listen to one of your colleagues do their thing, right? But what was so great about this class was that, that it, um, Bruce and I have very different uh, questions in mind. When I read that commentary, I want to know how he got from the text of what he said, because there is despite what people think, there is in that commentary a deep conviction about how the text works. But, but it's often, the pathway is hidden. He doesn't, he's not an explainer. You know, he tells us what he's found. And that was the part that interested me in putting it in conversation with more recent study of Paul. Bruce's questions are quite different. Bruce's questions were, always, how does this line up systematically? And I'm happy to say, some. sometimes I'm happy to say, eh, doesn't work. You know, I, I, I don't think you can make it work that way. Uh, so it was seeing how we have really almost different intellectual DNA. You know, we, we struggle with different questions. And for the most part, our answers were rather compatible. Hmm. So what happens when you do disagree? Can you disagree? Like in oh. front of students and oh yeah yeah now we we didn't very much very often do that typically we had he would lecture and I would lecture and the students would have a a tutorial with someone around the differences there there wasn't enough of that uh, give and take in the classroom. That sounds really, really interesting. And we've I, I've had an opportunity to do some of that interdisciplinary work, but. Um, but I think, you know, in a, in a time and place when there's so much uh, <laughs> siloing off of the disciplines, it's just a really, it's really inspiring to hear not only do you, you know, not only do you read theologically, but you actually co-teach with theologians. And it's just, uh, it's, it really is a great model for us to aspire to, I think. Well, one of the things that's important to me about this is that when I read theologians, I mean, one of the people I read regularly is Philip Ziegler, uh, because when I read Phil, I see things that I hadn't noticed before. And the problem with any field, I think it's true, certainly true in biblical studies, is we tend to have the same 10 questions about any verse, and we ask them over and over and over and over and over again. And you go somewhere else and read for a while, and maybe you get a different question. Maybe you turn the text around a different way. That's what's important to me. Mm. Let's talk about uh, apocalyptic, since you just brought up Philip Ziegel. Uh, so you're a key player in the apocalyptic school of Pauline scholarship. And since apocalyptic is kind of a slippery word, can you tell us what you mean by an apocalyptic reading? Yeah, an apocalyptic reading is sensitive to the, uh, the way in which, I'm thinking about Paul now in particular, the way in which the text reflects a, um, a conviction 
that the world has gone so badly wrong that it cannot be fixed by repairing itself. It can't be fixed by repenting. Uh, it can only be fixed by outside um, intervention in the form of divine action. At least theological apocalyptic begins with that kind of assumption. So why apocalyptic and not, you know, another approach to Paul's letters? Why do you think the apocalyptic approach is the best approach? I don't tend to think about these as competitive. Um, and to the disappointment of some people, I don't intend ever to get into a um, contest where, you know, my view is bigger than yours. I don't find that very satisfying. Um, I think apocalyptic helps me to account better for the texts, for their analysis of the human situation, uh, and for their radical understanding of what God does uh, in the Christ event. Uh, personally, as a Christian, I also find them uh, enormously enlightening in terms of the world we live in. And I, I trust there's no need to offer further evidence for that, uh, that, that we are uh, caught in forces that are uh, larger than of our own making and are in need of... Um, uh, outside assistance, if you'll have it. Yep, my Roman students are actually reading your little book, When in Romans, and they really like it, and they're very drawn to the apocalyptic um, apocalyptic perspective that you offer in that book. Their one hang-up, and, and this happens every semester, is that they, they get hung up on the, the pessimism of the apocalyptic perspective, the pessimistic anthropology. So they just, they want to, they want a word of comfort about, um, um, is there room for like a cheerier view of humanity within this hermeneutical framework? Or if, if we're, you know, if we're committed to the apocalyptic reading, do you think we have to be committed to a pretty dark anthropology? Well, Paul's, I mean, Paul's understanding of the human in Christo is a very optimistic understanding, right? Uh, the role of the spirit, you know, in Romans 8, a text you've worked with a great deal. Uh, th this notion in Romans 12 that you can present your entire self, uh, that you have abilities and gifts to dis of discernment and gifts of... Uh, worship and so forth, uh, uh, that's not at all pessimistic. But um, I would challenge your students to explain how they think um, without a, a pessimistic worldview, how they explain things like, uh, how they explain theologically things like uh, child slavery. Um, uh, how they explain human trafficking. Uh, is the victim of human trafficking simply to uh, free herself by thinking really good thoughts? No, that person has to be liberated. That, that's where I find it so compelling. Me too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and they, they come around around Romans 8, but those first couple of weeks are always always a hard go because the first couple chapters yeah. are so dark. Uh, right. Well, actually, it was my students who drove me to see this in the letter because you do read Romans 1 and you think, okay, I'm done with this. We're going to turn now. Where's Romans 3? And you think, okay, we're done with sin. Now we're going to... No, there's Romans 5. There's Romans 7. It's, you know, in Lee Keck's wonderful image, the, the argument keeps spiraling down. And that reflects, I think, his determination that we are going to get this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I and I spend so much time when I teach this class on Romans one through three because I say no, you have to understand the argument at the beginning because it it spirals over and over. So we have to lay a good foundation, otherwise we're not going to catch what he's doing in Romans five. And so, who is the I in Romans seven? Oh, um, I don't much think it matters. I think I, I think you know I was totally persuaded by Paul Meyer's argument 
that we are that, that our hang up is with that I where Paul is still writing about sin and its its capacity to take over even the good and holy and perfect law of God and produce chaos in the I. So in a sense, I think the I is every person. I think it's the, uh, the voice of the psalmist lamenting uh, the inability to do what one wishes. And I think it pulls us in so that there's a reason we identify with it. But I think getting caught up in that is missing the point of the text altogether. So you, you start your book when in Romans. You start in Romans 16. Why do you start in Romans 16? Because I have found con, uh, over and over and over that students, by which I mean all students, I was in a church on Sunday talking to a, a group of adults, uh, same thing. Uh, we don't hear Paul's letters as letters, and the only way to make them come alive as letters is to help people with the situation, which is where I am very much helped by historical questions, right? Uh, and also because there is still, I can't believe it, all these decades later, there is still this notion that Paul does not support uh, the, the women in ministry, uh, that Paul is negative about women. So you go to Romans 16 and all of a sudden you've got all these women in leadership. Uh, and that's a good, just a good entry place to make this a real letter to real people some of whom happen to be women. <laughs> yeah, about a third of them, right? Right. 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 And you and you wrote the foreword to um to Eldon Epps. Eldon's. Yeah. yeah. Junia the first so what what with with Junia and for listeners who maybe aren't familiar with the Junia Junius uh controversy um for about a century in the 20th century, we had uh, most English translations and the critical editions of the New Testament calling Junius a man, when in fact there's no evidence uh, for um, male Junius, that name doesn't exist in the first century. So uh, what do you think we should learn from that as you know, biblical scholars in general? What should we learn from this, like looking at this history of the textual variant that wasn't? One of the things we have to learn is that we are all fallible. You know, the, the best, uh, I shouldn't say the best, but some major players in the 20th century interpretation of Romans, going back to Lietzmann, uh, argued that this had to be a man because it couldn't possibly be a woman. So our assumptions about what can and can't happen get in our way. Uh, and we also have to be aware of... Uh, uh, again, I'm going to quote Paul Meyer. He used to say this to his students uh, of taking other people's judgments as evidence. You know, if you want to have evidence, you have to go to text, not other people's settled opinions. Mm. I always find that to be a fascinating text, too. I say it's the most interesting lecture on textual criticism that's not about textual criticism that you'll ever hear. <laughs> right, right. There is no textual variant. No. That's, that's part of the sham of the whole that's thing. That's right. That's right. So let's change gears just a, a little bit and talk about uh, my probably my favorite book of yours, Our Mother St. Paul, in which you deal with uh, Paul's use of maternal language. What sparked your interest in that topic? It goes back to uh, a lecture Phyllis Tribble gave uh, when I was teaching at Columbia Seminary. And I, I, I don't now remember what she said. It was something about imagery in the Old Testament and how there was no imagery of this sort in the New Testament. And my brain, saturated with Paul, went to Galatians 4.19. And I spent the next few days looking at commentaries and finding that, in, in Galatians 4.19, I should say, Paul says, uh, I am in labor with you again uh, until Christ be formed in you. And I went to look at commentaries and I found that without exception, if they mentioned the image of labor, which is uh, the labor of a woman giving birth, they said, this is another instance of Paul's use of paternal imagery. And I was off. You know, and I, it was just, that was it. 
Uh, and so once you find that text, then the next thing was First Thessalonians, where he uses this imagery of nursing, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, uh, and of course, as you know, Romans 8. All of this birth language, and what is it doing there? And how does it trouble our very masculine understandings of Paul and his thinking? Yeah, when I've done research on how... Uh how people understand the birth language in Romans 8, especially, I was really struck by every male commentator talking about how this was uh, the language of futility and anguish. And I just went, boy, that's depressing. That's not really what childbirth right. is about. <laughs> right. It is painful. Yes. <laughs> but it's, yes, right. Well, you know, once in a while, people will ask, I'm sure you get the same question. People have been reading these texts for 2,000 years. Why does anybody need another book on the New Testament? Uh, why does anybody need another commentary on Romans? Well, all of the players haven't asked all the same questions. And we bring to it new, not just new texts, new information, but we bring to it new situations and that cause us to see new things. Of course, as you know, one of the things I found in that research was that, as a matter of fact, in the early centuries of the church's life, people did notice this imagery, and they talked about it. And then somehow it goes in underground, and we don't notice it. Mm. So. so your your chapter on metaphor, actually, in the beginning of Our Mother St. Paul, is the book that piqued my interest in metaphors, because you made them seem fascinating, and you made them seem important for understanding Scripture, and you and you treat them as metaphors. And, and you immediately catch, caught my attention, and I'm sure catch everybody's attention who reads that book, because you, you use these two funny examples that are not biblical. You say, first one, the first one was, uh, SBL is the NFL of biblical scholarship, <laughs> And the second was snow is the underside of hell. And, and, um, and, and, I, and then you go on to say, you know, I rejected the first one out of hand because I'm, I'm convinced that SBL is not the NFL of biblical scholarship. Why are you convinced that it's not the NFL of biblical scholarship? Maybe because I hate football. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that language, um, I, I just, I understand the analogy but it it's so to me all it conjures up is violence and conflict, and uh, I understand that there's a bit, very a fair amount of conflict in competing views of scripture in the SBL. But that's not my favorite part, so I just I didn't want to go there. So the other one came out of a um, an experience my son had after we'd had a terrible terrible winter in Princeton. And his, one of his English teachers had them write, uh, construct metaphors. And I don't remember whether that was his or someone else's, but I loved it. And I thought, this is exactly the kind of Pauline metaphor that twists things around. Yeah, that, that really was a great metaphor. And I grew up in Minnesota, so it spoke to me also. <laughs> Uh, but what was fascinating about the first one is that you go on in that chapter to talk about how metaphors extend invitations to intimacy between their makers and their hearers. And, and as I was rereading that chapter, I found myself reflecting on, you know, how even if a even a bad metaphor like SBL is the NFL of biblical scholarship, when you point out its inaptness, uh, it still creates boundary right. uh, bonds between you have to think about it right yeah so i immediately went yeah she's right that is a terrible metaphor for what happens at sbl uh and it and you know that it creates barriers around people who might think you know no that's actually a great metaphor for what happens at sbl i don't know who those people are but um, they may be maybe they're out there maybe they love football and those those two things go together to me they they don't but uh so that I, those bonds and barriers have been interesting to me, but I always struggle with the question, um, how do we go about in the biblical text discerning a social function of a metaphor? How do we determine how those metaphors are creating bonds or if they're creating bonds, if we can't have access to the original audience? Well, we can't. You know, we, we guess at that. And I mean, you've done a lot of work on metaphor and how it works. To me, the point that was important and remains important about that is that when we talk about Paul's thought, uh, 
if we talk about Paul's theology or people who want to talk about his ideology, we tend to reduce it to propositions. And we tend to avoid those metaphorical, that metaphorical language on the ground that it is imprecise or it's merely illustrative. Or if we use it, uh, if, if we turn to it, then we tend to want to find a single answer. It does one thing. It doesn't do any of these other things. And so we want to reduce the text. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm talking to the person who knows more about this than I do. Uh, but instead of opening up possibilities, and um, I think when we try to reduce text to a single possibility, which is a peculiarly Christian uh, endeavor, uh, then in a sense we've made the text dead, we've killed the text. Uh, you know, if, if I can produce once and for all the right interpretation of this text, then you don't need the text anymore. You can just rely on me. And there is no living word there. It's, it's dead. Uh, so I think that's one of the places where metaphor is extremely important for what we do. Now, you know, I didn't answer your question having to do with how we know it worked or didn't. I think we have to look at other examples. In my early work on this, I tried to look at maternal language, how it functioned in some philosophical texts. Uh, again, we don't have access to audiences, but we can certainly imagine, which is what historians do to begin with. Mm. So. Mm. so speaking of opening up possibilities, I love that turn of phrase, it, metaphors open up possibilities. What possibilities do you think Paul's maternal language opens up for pastoral ministry? Why are those, why are those metaphors important for shaping pastors? Well, at a very basic level, noticing them stands um, as a correction to certain understandings of Paul as this very aggressive, maybe, I don't know, I don't know anything about football, maybe the quarterback, you know, who's, or the linebacker, I don't know, somebody who's really taking the field, right? Um, that uh, language of, of childbirth, for example, is it is not just vulnerable, but it is vulnerable. Uh, it, it says something about the way in which ministry, to the extent that it's language used for ministry, or for the Christian life in Romans 8, it says something about not being in control, working, yes, laboring, yes, but not being in control, not being in charge. I think there's an awful lot of wisdom in that for pastoral, uh, pastoral labor. We're going to change gears again. Are you up for a speed round? A yeah, speed, I guess. A speed round is where I'm going to ask you a series of questions and we give you like 10, 15 seconds to answer and you don't have to overthink it or you don't get to okay. overthink it. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. And some of these questions are serious and some of them are a little off the wall. <laughs> All right. Okay. So if I invited you over for dinner, what is one thing that you hope is not on the menu? Avocado. Oh, amen. I Avocados are the worst. I feel so much better that you just said that because I feel like it's like that's my opinion that I should be embarrassed about Matt Bates, that I don't like avocado. No. Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> uh, mountains or ocean? Uh, ocean. Are you a Harry Potter fan? Yes. If you are a Harry Potter fan, what is your Hogwarts house? I can't remember any of them at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad to hear that you're a Harry Potter fan. Uh, what is a trend in society that scares you? Oh, goodness. One, uh, uh, hostility to the other. Hmm. What is one thing that you wish all your incoming PhD students knew? How to read Greek uh, without having to look at the lexicon all the time. Hmm. If you had to pick a song for your life, what would the song be? Song title? Uh, it would be the doxology. Hmm. Well, that's a great answer. 
Do you have any hidden talents? Um, I make great soup. Ooh. I'm not sure that's hidden, but... Well, yeah. hidden from most of us who don't get yeah. to come over for soup. What's something that brings you hope? Watching children play. <laughs> Do you believe in ghosts? No. Where is somewhere you've always wanted to travel? Turkey. Oh, have you been to Turkey? I have not. Because <gasps> uh, when I had Paul Chabilko on, he said, can I pick somewhere that I've been before? And I said, sure. <laughs> and he picked Turkey. And I know he's, I mean, he spent a lot of time there, but that's his, that's his favorite too. And then the final, final question in our speed round, uh, this is one we ask all of our guests. What do you think is the most important book in biblical studies in the last 50 years? The most influential is certainly uh, Ed Sanders' Paul and Palestinian Judaism. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a common answer. Yeah, I think uh, I think most people have said that or Paul and the Gift. Um, yeah, and if I had if I could only have three books on th three books on Paul, uh, they would be Paul and the Gift, uh, Martin's Galatians commentary. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, sorry to your colleague, but Bart's Rumber Brief. <laughs> <laughs> I love that commentary. I, I read it every semester and I just find it, I just find it fascinating. I find his, yeah, yeah. So when Matt Bates said that, I said, well, I love Carl Bart and you're wrong. So <laughs> Good for you. I vote with you. Yes. Uh, speaking of J. Lewis Martin, um, I was reading that your fest shrift in, in preparation for this this interview and uh, read his his touching remark that he gives at the beginning, and I'm going to read it for our audience. Um, he says, a venerable piece of wisdom has it that the true gift to the teacher is the genuine student whose learning process reaches out and engages the teacher, thereby causing both parties to emerge changed, enriched in ways anticipated by neither. Student becomes teacher and teacher student. As both are surprised by new vistas opened up precisely in their instructive comradeship. It is an event of grace. And so it was to be a teacher to Beverly Gaventa. What's it like to have a former teacher write words like that about you? Um, well, the night that uh, David and Matt gave me the table of contents, they gave me that. And I, I wept all night and into the next day. Uh, it's very satisfying. That's, but it was typical of Lou to be so gracious. Um, he, he created conversation partners by his generosity of spirit. So there, that, that was just typical of Lou. And what about uh, J. Lewis Martin has most influenced you, do you think? I think from the very first class I had with him, it was his absorption in the text of the New Testament. When, and his absorption as a reader, whether he read the New Testament or Epictetus or Fourth Ezra or your most recent paper, he read it um, as a serious text from which he had to learn things. And that's why people, um, uh, he took his work very seriously. He took his students and colleagues very seriously. And I think that's why some people who even disagree with him strongly have found so much to respect about his, his labor. So as you reflect on your many years as a teacher and a scholar, what lessons have you learned along the way that you think would be beneficial or most beneficial to pass on to the next generation? Of teachers? Or researchers, or both? Whatever you want to say. <laughs> One of the things I finally learned as a teacher was uh, that every generation is going to be different. So you always plan, you know, mentally, you always plan a course for the last group you had. They never come back. Uh, one of the things I had, wish I had uh, learned earlier was that I didn't have to accept an invitation just because it was extended. I've spent some time writing papers and writing articles that I really wasn't compelled by, and those that everything takes longer if you're making yourself do it. Um, 
And I, I think something Lou tried to teach me many years ago, which is that whatever you do, it's not the last word. You know, you, you're part of a conversation and you don't get to have the last word in it. Hmm. Is there ever a time, if you're willing to share this, uh, it's a question that we actually had posed to us as hosts uh, the last time we did a Q&A, and it was a really interesting conversation. So we thought we'd start posing it to our guests, so if you're comfortable answering it. Is there a time that you can think of uh, in your professional life when you experienced failure? And if how did that shape you, that experience of failure? Uh, several things come to mind. Uh, serious disappointments about some things I wanted along the way. Um, I think I have, I think most of my failings, which to me sounds like something I did, not something that was done to me, most of my failings have to do with lack of confidence um, from time to time in my own ability to do things. And um, I, I, have to learn again and again that uh, I do have a voice and people are interested in what I do and I'm not going to solve all the problems, but I need uh, to, to get on with it rather than worrying myself. You know, I, I worry too much, as a friend tells me. <laughs> um, well, I think... Um... I think it's clear from even a you know a cursory reading of your work that you are so conscientious um, with the text and you that and and I think it seems to me when I read at least that it comes from this you know firm commitment that scripture is alive and it's relevant and it's profound and it was profound in the first century when Paul was writing and it's profound now in the twenty first century. So what do you think? Um, what do you think that American Christians most need to hear from scripture? at such a time as this? Well, there are lots of things, and it depends on which American Christians it is, right? Um, I think, from, for one thing, we need to learn um, that God is God and we are not. We need to be reminded of that on a daily basis, left, right, and center. Um, I think we need not to confuse, need to stop confusing the American project uh, with God. That is to say, uh, confusing the will of um, uh, some leaders with the will of God. Um, I think maybe more than anything else, I would put front and center. Uh, the the, um, uh, the well to take us back to the beginning the epistemology of the cross that is to say the the way in which we value and evaluate other people in this country is uh, totally distorted it has to do with money and it has to do with appearance and it has to do with achievement and status and none of those things um, counts for anything. Uh, in, in any part of scripture that I've ever read, uh, Paul or anywhere else. So we, we, need to, we need to get our values straightened out. Hmm. And our, uh, our final question on OnScript is always, if you're a listener, you probably know it's coming, but our final question is always, what's one idea or trend in biblical studies that needs to die? That needs to go the way of the dodo bird. Uh, the idea that there is a single meaning of any text, uh, or that, or that I will find the idea that some scholar will find the right answer and everyone else can go home. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, that one spoke to me personally. <laughs> <laughs> and it's good, you know. It's good for a younger scholar to hear that too, because it means that maybe we'll still have things to be writing about when we're at the end of our careers. I, and I certainly, I certainly think that's the case. And um, I, you know, I'm only in my fifth year of of my professional life, really. And but I, I feel like every year I come back to Romans, especially, and I just go, "There's so much more to learn. There's so many more things that I want to ask." And yeah, it's just, I'll never get tired of it. And really, truly, you've modeled that for me. Um, your work well, has modeled that you. for me. So I appreciate it very much. Well, I appreciate that. Um, 
You're oh. doing great work. Oh, th- so. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh, and I oh, I should mention this guy. I want you to give you a chance to mention it. What's what's next for you, Beverly Gaventa? What's in the pipeline? What's your big project that we can be anticipating? I am working, as I have been now for some time, on a commentary on Romans um, for the New Testament Library. I learn something about it every day, uh, which means it's taking longer and longer than I imagined, because every day I learn something else, I have to go back and, uh, and rethink what I've already decided. Uh, it is the most uh, stimulating, difficult project I've ever had, uh, and I... I'm I'm grateful for it. Hmm. Well, I will be. I'm I'm looking forward to that coming out when it when you are finally Thank finished you. with it. I'm I'm. Oh, I cannot wait for that to come out. <laughs> thanks. Well, on behalf of all of us at OnScript, uh, thanks so much for being here today, Beverly. It's really been a pleasure having you. And for everyone listening, I hope you go out and uh, buy a few of Beverly's books. Uh, and if you want to click through on our website, that gives us a little kickback. Thanks so much for listening. You have been listening to OnScript, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just 2 or $5 per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study donate.